All right, good morning, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. So if you want to stand on up as we sing, Holy is the Lord. Take some time to greet the person next to you and share God's love with them. Thanks. <laughs> 
Test. All right, Ooh, a little loud. Okay, let's go ahead and make our way to our seats. First and foremost, aloha and welcome to Mililani Community Church. It's really good to see everyone here. Um, really nice. Once again, unfortunately, our uh, outside sitting is not available. I know I've mentioned about the eucalyptus smell. You get to enjoy it very soon. Um, at the end of this service, um, Uncle John will be spearheading to help put back the tents. So um, if you guys, uh, if anyone is willing and able to assist with that, we can, um, after church, uh, Uncle John Ueno is going to be the point of contact. And you'll see him. He's he the one just running out there. <laughs> um, so uh, please assist if can uh, to help set up the tents. And then um, if you want to follow along with me, um, your your pamphlets in the back kind of has the announcements too. Um, so I, if I've kind of glossed over some things, uh, just let me know. But the, the two biggest things that I really want to um, hit on and kind of sound like a broken record, but preschool is still in dire need of two part-time workers. So if you know anybody um, who's um, looking to work with kids or assist um, um, Milani Community Church's preschool, uh, please contact Pastor Jason with that. And also, I want to give an opportunity um, to you guys as well, that if you feel the burden or the want to assist and serve in this church, we have um, wonderful ministries and volunteer um, places that we would love to uh, help you guys uh, go in. Uh, cough, cough, the children's church and nursery. Just a heads up there. <laughs> Um, but, and then also the facility point of person for the churches while we're looking um, for someone to kind of help um, ease and fill in the role that uh, Uncle Dan Fukumai was um, doing such a wonderful job. Uh, once again, just looking for someone to kind of help spearhead the facility um, for that. And then, so I was thinking today, you know, as I was coming to church and, you know, I, I'm from town and I, I don't know if if you're from Hawaii, there's a difference from town and then the other side, we, we're called townies. Um, but, you know, the one thing that I love driving, um, coming from town uh, to Milani area is that, man, it feels like Hawaii, you know? You see the Waianae Ranges, you see the Ko'olau Ranges, and, and it's just really something about it. Hawaii has so much history behind it. And so I was thinking to myself, you know, I don't know if we have a lot of people that, you know, are from here or, you know, our military that come. But if you are, if you know anything about Hawaii, whether it's from Blue Hawaii Elvis or Lilo and Stitch, you know, you know that there's a lot of culture in Hawaii. So today I want to, I was thinking, and forgive me if I butcher the words, okay, but I want to teach us Hawaiian words. How's that sound? Yeah, we try, we try. Okay, so the word that we're going to teach today is e pulu um, kakao. Okay, so we're going to break it down, break it down, break it down. Say e pulu. Okay, kakao. All right, so e pulu kakao means let's pray. The e pulu part is pray, and kakao means let's do it. So with that being said, e pulu kakao, let me open us up in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for such another wonderful day in Hawaii. Lord, I just pray that we can continue to just be inspired by the surroundings that you've placed us to be. Um, Lord, you have guided us our footsteps um, and our travels from wherever you had started us to where you have us now. Lord, it is just wonderful to continue to walk in your presence. I pray that we give this um, wonderful Sunday to you, and that you can open up our hearts and our minds to hear your words. In your son's name we pray. Amen.
So we introduced this song last week uh, called Hymn of Heaven.
strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart, I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me thence depart. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Because a sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on Him and pardon me. To look on Him and pardon me. him there, the risen Lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace, one in himself I cannot die, my soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God. With Christ my Savior and my God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the
blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you, the only wise King. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing, Praise to the King of Kings, you are my everything, and I will adore you. Filled with wonder, awestruck wonder, at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Yeah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the king of kings you are my everything and i will adore you i will adore you she blessed me with a prayer father god we declare you as the Alpha and the Omega, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty God. May the songs we sing and the worship we bring unto you this morning be acceptable in your sight. Please be with Pastor Jason as he preaches your word to us. I'm grateful to have him back in our worship service and our fellowship this morning. We lift this time up to you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thanks, us. Oh, the children are dismissed. They know where to go. Good morning. So glad to be back with you. Thank you so much. We had a wonderful vacation here, staycation, I guess. Um, it was good. Wrestled with the Lord a few times, but it was good. Vacation started well. The second week, all of us were pretty much sick. So I was complaining like, oh, this is how you celebrate a vacation. <laughs> and then third week went good. So, um, but glad to be back. Um, so I hope um, you were blessed by all the, the very speakers that were here. Uh, Wilson, thank you, and Paul, thank you, and um, of course, Associate Pastor at Faith Christian Fellowship, one of our sister churches, um, Gary, Gary Blevins was here last week, so thank God for him. Um, just a couple announcements, um, maybe to reiterate. Um, this coming Saturday is the men's prayer breakfast, so please sign up in the back. Um, the, it's good food and, and fellowship, and men will pray together as well. So be sure to sign up in the back. Also in the back there, there's a new members um, class that I'm going to be running uh, to be determined um, in the time and when. But just put your name down if you're interested in becoming a member. I'm going to run a, a class for you. So please um, fill out your name there and the information. All right. Okay. Well, let's uh, get started. 
Um, if you would, turn to Revelation chapter 4 in your Bible, and I'll open us in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege to, to be here, and thank you, Lord, for this gathering. We, Lord, Lord, we ask that you would prepare our hearts to receive wonderful things from your truth, that you would open our eyes to catch a glimpse of what the angels and the saints in heaven are doing and seeing, and we pray that that would mark our worship here. So, Lord, be with us now as we um, catch a glimpse into heaven before the throne. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a worship leader who, who once said um, that we can't play certain songs that express too graphically what Jesus did on the cross when, a lot of, when, when there's a lot of non-Christians that come to service. And when asked why, the reply was that it might scare them away, that it might not, they might not want to come back. If the songs speak about Jesus dying and the blood and, and so forth. So we should avoid these songs. In other words, let's be content with giving people more, a more tame and palatable Jesus, a more inviting, less threatening, less gruesome picture of Jesus. My opinion, actually my, my conviction is no way. We need to let all people see God for who He is, right? The, the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ for us in our place is, our, is central to our hope. It's central to our hope. A.W. Tozer once said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. How we view God affects our lives. We don't want people having a small view of God here at MCC. It's, it's our desire that people have a high view of God, not a God who we can tame. Right? We want a picture of God who is worthy of passionate praise and worship and life. We don't want to hide things about God that He does not hide in His Word. That's putting the wisdom of man over and above the wisdom of God. We need, to, we need God as God reveals Himself in the Word. The depths and the passion of our desire to ascribe to God greatness and worth is connected to our vision of God. The increasing growth of our walk in, of faith in this world finds its anchor in an increasingly enlarged view and vision of God that we follow. And so my desire for myself and for you is that we would have an increasingly more passionate, joy-filled, awe-inspiring life of worship that makes much of God. We want to be a people that make much of God. In our passage for this morning, we see such worship going on in the book of Revelation. We get a glimpse of whom the angels and the people of God never cease to worship and praise. So if you would, if you haven't yet, turn with me in your Bible to the last book in the New Testament, Revelation, not Revelations, Revelation chapter 4. We look at verses 8 through 11. <clears throat> Revelation 4, 8 through 11. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, and are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him who is seated on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. In this text, we get a glimpse of worship that is going on in heaven. Who the object, who the focus of worship must be is unmistakable. The focus of our time together this week as well as next week is this, that the blazing center of our life of worship is got to be God. 
It's got to be God. It kind of falls in line with what Paul was talking about in his Revelation class this morning. As Christians, we have the privilege to get a picture. We get a vision. We get a view of what's happening in heaven as we read the scripture. We see something that awaits us as pilgrims journeying through this world that's not our home. Heaven's our home. And along the journey, we tell as many people as we can about our great God and our great Savior with the hopes that God would turn them into God worshipers, they that they would accompany us heavenward. My friends, are you encouraged and refreshed as we gather together to corporately worship our God when you come here? I am. And I'm so glad to be back here with you. Our worship on earth, my friends, must progressively reflect worship that is presently taking place in heaven, even as I speak. There's no such thing as lackluster, uh, quote-unquote, worship service in heaven. There's none of that. There's no such thing as a dull or dreary worship experience. No, life in heaven treats God, it treats Jesus as, as significant. What you have in heaven is passion-filled, God-exalting worship that is rooted in a clear knowledge of the truth, of who God is, what He's like, and what that means for us. So let's get a glimpse of God together this morning. The first thing we note in our passage is that, number one, God is admired for His greatness. God is admired for His greatness. His greatness is admired as He is trumpeted forth as holy. Take a look at verse 8. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes and all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. God is admired for the fact that He is holy. Or as theologians say when referring to God's holiness, God is transcendent. Dr. John Frame has said, Transcendence ev invokes the biblical language of God's majesty and holiness. He's enthroned on high. In Psalm 97, verse 9, Psalm 97, verse 9, it says, For you, O Yahweh, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted above all gods. My friends, God is most high. He's exalted. He's lifted up. He's far above all gods, all these so-called gods. You know, we think, therefore, of God's royal dignity, as Frame puts it, his kingship, his rulership, his lordship. In Psalm 113, verses 5 and 6, Psalm 119, verse 5 and 6, it says, Who is like Yahweh, our God? Who is seated on high? Who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? There's none. There is none like the Holy One. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 25, it says, To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him? Says the Holy One. There's none like God. To trumpet forth that God is holy also means not only that He's transcendent, that there's none like Him, but that he is also morally pure. He's morally pure. He has no stain of sin. Therefore, God never makes mistakes. He never makes mistakes in the womb or outside the womb. He never makes misjudgments. He never makes miscalculations. All his ways are right. All his ways are pure. And one day, he will be worshipped and acknowledged as such by every single person. In the book, book of Revelation, if we go back to chapter 15 toward the um, latter part of Revelation, we see this. Who will not fear, O Lord? Who will not glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you for your righteous acts have been revealed. God is trumpeted forth as holy, and he's also admired as he's proclaimed as sovereign, as sovereign. Notice the cherubim and the hosts of heaven worship in verse 8, the Lord God. This refers to God as the sovereign ruler. He's the Lord God, the one who is in absolute control. 
He, is, he has supreme authority to do whatever he pleases, whenever he pleases, and to whomever he pleases. And no one can stop the hand of God. Oh yes, mankind likes to think they can stop the hand of God, but it's a delusion. You cannot stop the hand of God. He's sovereign. He has the wisdom, he has the right, and he has the power to do whatever he pleases, not just in heaven, but also here on earth as well. And that includes your life and my life as well. The Bible says in 1 Chronicles 29, Yours, O Yahweh, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Yahweh, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to everyone. My friends, God is sovereign over all. He's also sovereign over nature. You know, when God commands the Red Sea to open up so that His people can walk on dry land, it does just that. And when God commands the waters to row back and destroy Pharaoh and the Egyptian army, it obeys. In Psalm 89, verse 9, it says, You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. God is sovereign over nature. God is sovereign over nations. Psalm 22, verse 28, For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he, that is Yahweh, rules over the nations. And therefore, God is also sovereign over kings. Authorities. Proverbs 21, verse 1 says, The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wills. My friends, the leadership in this world, maybe not just this world, but our country and our state, they think they're are, they are big shots and they call the shots, but God is sovereign over them and he can remove them in an instant if he, would, if he chooses. God is sovereign over kings and authorities and leaders. God is sovereign also over the intentions of man. Remember Joseph in the Old Testament? Back in Genesis 50, Joseph, his brothers, intended evil for Joseph as they sold him into slavery. First they beat him up, they threw him in a ditch, right? And they sold him off to slavery because they were jealous. But God's purpose stood. And Joseph confessed in Genesis 50, As for you, his brothers, you meant evil by your evil acts, which you did to me. You meant evil. You had a purpose in it. But God, he says, meant it for good. In other words, God had a purpose in that same thing. To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. They had a purpose. They fulfilled it. God had a purpose, and his purpose triumphed. This is why Job acknowledged, you know Job, right? Righteous Job went through the ringer, endured bad counsel, then got a little prideful, voiced things to God. God spoke to him in questions for three chapters and silenced Job, and at the end of the day, Job said this, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. God is also sovereign in salvation. When you think about your salvation, God's also sovereign in that. It's not the will of man that turns a sinner dead in his sins and trespasses into a child of God. Man's will is not the decisive factor. Those who become children of God, as John chapter 1 says, they were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, literally that, that says, not of human willing, but of God, but of God. God is sovereign over nations, over kings, over man, in our salvation. Our God is a holy sovereign. He's our rock in the midst of a world that's falling apart. So it seems. A country like ours that seems to be dismantling over the past, I don't know, less than two years. 
It's one of the things that drove me crazy on my vacation. Certain things happened in our country. And my wife told me, Get, stop watching the news. <laughs> but friends, I hope, I hope you can see. Because I, I don't think it's the, you know, I don't think it's the, I don't think it's the laughing matter what's going on. I hope you can see the depravity of man in our country, in our state. Politicians and news outlets promote and they insist, school boards insist that we on us approving and accepting and affirming things that are so contrary to God, to God's design, to God's word. But I must remember, you must remember, we must remember that our God is the Holy Sovereign. Yes, we speak. We shouldn't be silent any longer, church. We speak and we need to vote. If you haven't registered to vote, you should register to vote in November. And we should fight with our minds. But we should also remember that God is in control when things don't go the way we want in our lives, in our state, in our country, in our world. And He's the anchor when things don't go as planned or as we expect or thought. Thirdly, His greatness is admired as He is declared the Almighty. In verse 8, God not, is not only declared as the Holy One, the Sovereign One, but He's also called the Almighty. This refers to God in His, aws in his awesomeness of His power. He's omnipotent. That is, He has all power. Notice, in, in Isaiah 40, verse 26, six, it says, Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? He who brings out their host by number, calling them by name, by the greatness of his might. And because he is strong in power, not one is missing. That's our God. God is the one who upholds the stars, which are immensely uh, heavy. Where's Evan? He's our NASA guy. How heavy is a star? Must be like billions of tons or something like that. But he holds them in their place. That's a question for the young adult Bible study next week. Evan, how heavy is a star? Um, anyway, the Almighty, right? He, he demonstrated his power when he sent the plagues on, on the Egyptians. You remember that, don't you? God turned water into blood. He brought frogs onto the land. He sent lice. Then it was followed by insects to go and pester all the Egyptians. God then caused disease to fall on their cattle. And furthermore, he brought upon them human skin disease. And then he rained hail upon them, which affected their cattle and their crops. And moreover, locusts were sent to swarm Egypt, right? And this was followed, you remember, by darkness over the whole land. And then finally, screeching in the night, what did God do? He caused all the firstborn Egyptians to die. After all that, Pharaoh finally released God's people. But why 10 plagues? Couldn't God have just used one? Now, I know each one of those plagues attacks one of the Egyptian gods, but couldn't God just use one plague? God answers this very question. If you ever thought about that question, he answers that very question himself. In Exodus chapter 9, if you want to turn there, Exodus 9, verse 15. Exodus chapter 9, verse 15. Back at the beginning of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus 9, verse 15. For by now, God said, I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague that would have wiped you off the earth. But, but I've raised you up for this very purpose, that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. In other words, God could have used just one plague, right, to wipe out Pharaoh. For by now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague, singular, that would have wiped you off the face of this planet. However, God used ten plagues to show his great power so that his name, Yahweh, the Lord, would be known throughout the earth. Right? It's just like when you think of somebody weightlifting, you know, you put on 45s and somebody does that, oh yeah, it was, oh, 135, not so bad. Then they put on another plate. 
225, 315, and then it keeps going up 405, and then you get more impressed by that, right? And then I remember one of my friends, powerlifting friends, um, we dropped him off one day after high school, and uh, he graduated, but no, no, he was still in high school. Big dude, and uh, we dropped him off in front of his house, and we knew how much he could lift at the gym, but then he had a station wagon in front of his house. So we go lift that, lift that. <laughs> And then he got behind it and he lifted the thing up. And we were just, whoa, awesome, right? But that's kind of the idea with this thing with God and the plagues, to show his mighty power throughout the earth, to spread his fame about how awesome and, and, and he is. Let's be awestruck of the Holy One. Let's hail the Sovereign One. Stand in great admiration of the Almighty One. My friends, in addition to this, God's greatness is admired as He's affirmed as eternal. He's called, notice back in Reve uh, Revelation 4, in verse 8, the one who was and who is and who is to come. God always was and always will be. There was never a time when God was not. There was never a time when God came into being. In Psalm 90, verse 2, it says, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God is not created. It has always been. This is important because if God is not created, he will never die. In addition, as we look at Psalm 90, what it does, it seems to indicate that the process of Moses, when he acknowledges God as eternal, and says the mountains, they're not eternal, but God, you are from everlasting to everlasting. He then directs the attention of that knowledge of God back to himself. While doing that, he recognizes and he says humans are like grass. Right? They, did, they, they sprout up, but then at the end of the day, they wither away. They're here today and they're gone tomorrow. Therefore, in light of the fact that he's not eternal like God, he asks God to do something for him. He says, Lord, help me to number my days that I might gain a heart of wisdom. In other words, God, help me to number my days so I don't waste my life. Something we should pray as well. Finally, as James Boyce points out, this knowledge of God's eternality brings great assurance because Moses knows that if God is his refuge or if his dwelling place, he is eternally secure. My friends, God is not created, but we are. The stars, the moon, the sun, the earth, the animals in the sky, on the land and underneath in the sea, they all have a beginning. We all have come into being at some point. God, on the, other, on the other hand, stands outside of time. He's not bound by time like we are. He's not, cre he's not created. He existed before anything came into being. This is the one who is the object and the focus of our worship. When we come together to worship God, there ought to be a sense of anticipation. There ought to be a sense, of not, not programs and stuff and gimmicks, but an anticipation that God is real, that God is in this place. And oh, what a God he is. The songs that we sing should echo back who he is. Who he is and what he's like should fill us with a sense of wonder and amazement that we, mere mortals, have the awesome privilege to worship and make much of such a God. And then finally, friends, God's greatness is admired as he is praised that he does not change. Verse 8 tells us that he is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and always. There's another word that's used when we refer to the fact that God never changes. It's the word immutable. God is immutable. To say that God is immutable means he doesn't change. As, J as James says in James chapter 1, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. God doesn't change. And there are many ways in which God doesn't change. He doesn't change in His essential nature. His nature doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and always. As Malachi 
Uh, 3.6 says, as God declares, God declares, and He says, I, the Lord, do not change. God's purposes do not change. You know, many times you and I have charted our course only to find us changing from what we started, right? We've done that a lot through COVID. Many students in college do just that. They change from one major to another. One student I know of uh, was wanting to be a pediatrician. Now he's a lawyer. I, th I thought I was going to be an elementary school teacher. But here I am for the past, oh, 27 years now serving as a pastor. Proverbs 19, verse 21 says, Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it's the purpose of the Lord that will stand. You may think that this path of education is what God wants you on. You may think that this career choice of yours is what you're going to spend the rest of your life in. You may think that significant other is the one that's going to be yours for a lifetime. You may have planned your retirement or your next trip down to the very T. You may have ordered your week. It may happen. It may not happen. God's not against planning. But as Christians, we ought to say, not my will, but yours be done. However difficult, however mysterious sometimes it is, however contrary to our thoughts they are at times, however it may, quote unquote, ruin my plans, right? God's purpose will stand and we need to enjoy resting in his purposes and be at peace with it because that will most glorify God. My friends, God's purpose for Jesus Christ will not change. It is the purpose of God that all will honor the Son. One day, in Philippians 2 says, one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is going to happen. That's why we urge people, right? That's why we need to urge people as Christians to receive Jesus right now while there's time. Because at the end of the day, everyone, everyone is going to bow their knee to Jesus and they're going to acknowledge who He is. It will either be with joy and gladness or with filled with regret and sorrow. God's purpose for Jesus will not change. God's purpose for his people will not change. In, Ro in Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and 29, it says that all who, are, who love God, those who are called according to his purpose, God works all things for good in their lives. That's a promise for his people. That's God's purpose for all his children. And in that same passage, God promises to make us just like Jesus in our character, to shape us. That's his promise. That's his purpose for us. So no matter what you encounter or endure in this life's journey, that's God's purpose for you. He is committed to, through everything that you go through, good, bad, sad, happy, whatever it is, through everything, God is conforming you to the image of His Son. He is making you more like Jesus. He's chipping away those rough edges. He's doing some heart surgery that is painful, but He's doing it all so that you will be like Jesus in your character more and more. His purpose for us won't change. And then finally, God's purposes for God rebels will not change. In Exodus chapter 34, it says that God will by no means clear the guilty. You break one of God's law, he will be held accountable to it. Hebrews 9 says, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after this comes judgment. John chapter 3, Jesus said, Whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Or in John 3, it says again, Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him my friend today is the day of salvation now is the acceptable time if you have not received christ you can either go on life and then face eternity bearing the weight of your sins against god or you can trust jesus christ who on that cross over two thousand years ago took your sins so that you wouldn't have to you wouldn't have to go through the wrath of god so that you could have a relationship with god this day you must come to Christ. Turn from your sins. Repent. And this day decide to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and the treasure of your heart. 
and he will come and he will save you and you will have no fear of that but rather you will have the promises of God to live and expect and enjoy and anticipate my friends we're going to stop right here we're going to pick up next week the rest of the passage but my friends there's coming a day when our worship of God will be just as we desired long for and beyond even what we're capable of even imagining the center of our life and worship is God and our worship here on earth is to increasingly become what it will be like in the future where it's going to happen may we make much of our great God who is admired for his greatness as he is trumpeted forth as holy as he is proclaimed as sovereign as he is, as he is declared as the Almighty as he is affirmed as eternal and praised for his immutability may God fan a flame of passion in our hearts for his greatness may he give us a vision an enlarged vision of who he is and what he's like amen let's pray father thank you so much for allowing us the privilege to open your word this morning thank you for the privilege that we have to not necessarily guess of what's going to take place in heaven but you give us glimpses of that throughout the Bible so we can know what's going on and what it would be like. God, would you help us? Would you help our worship as a, as a congregation, our worship as we live life? May it reflect more and more of what it's going to be like when we see you face to face in heaven. May we worship you right now as we sing May we catch a glimpse of that, of what's going on in heaven today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Jason. It's good to have you back. <laughs> Can everyone stand for a closing song together? Oh,
always be. You were, you are, you will always be. You were, you are, you will always be. One more time. You were, you are, you will always be. Yeah. You were, you are, you will To come. Amen. Jubilee, closing word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we were created to worship you alone. Your greatness is unsearchable, and there is none like you. You are holy, sovereign, the Almighty One. You are eternal and unchanging. And the characteristics that we hold on to, may our love view of who you are continually grow and expand. May we worship you wholeheartedly this week, um, bringing glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. We'll see you next week.